Tak. That, that's the only Swedish I will inflict on you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, and uh, Lisa for organizing this conference and the invitation to come to Stockholm. Uh, we've had uh, a terrific scientific meeting yesterday uh, and uh, a chance to collaborate and meet with colleagues, uh, uh, for me, uh, all the colleagues in Europe, and uh, I think it was a very productive meeting. Uh, Okay, so Lisa asked me to talk about uh, something I've been working on for the past 20 years, uh, orthostatic intolerance in uh, MECFS. And I thought I'd uh, introduce the concept of orthostatic intolerance first, and then look at the evidence for this problem in MECFS in pediatrics. And my take home message from the start is that this is almost universal in children with MECFS. Uh, and that all of the studies that have been done using healthy controls have shown a much higher prevalence of orthostatic intolerance in MECFS. It's a treatable component of the illness. And uh, the other thing is that uh, symptoms of orthostatic intolerance are also common in adults with the disorder, even though the hemodynamic abnormalities are somewhat less frequent. But. Uh, MECFS is not just orthostatic intolerance, and it's a heterogeneous mix of conditions. So I want to talk about a couple that we've found to be important in the treatment of our patients, uh, one being a milk protein hypersensitivity, a delayed uh, allergic reaction that's termed a non-IgE-mediated response. We find that in about 30% of our pediatric patients. The second is even more common, uh, joint hypermobility, which we find in 60% of the MECFS population. Some of them also have a more extreme form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, we also uh, find a very high prevalence, somewhat paradoxically perhaps, of movement restrictions, tightness in the nervous system. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll end with one caution. Uh, about the importance of doing careful neurologic examinations in patients because of a small subset who can present with fatigue and orthostatic intolerance, but they have a neuroanatomic problem with either crowding of the hindbrain with Chiari malformation or uh, congenital or acquired cervical stenosis. And I wanted to end with that component because much of our thinking about the uh, deformative stress on the spinal cord comes from Alf Brieg, who is a neurosurgeon here in Stockholm and who wrote about adverse mechanical tension in the nervous system many years ago. And most, most of modern physical therapy that addresses this has uh, derived a lot from his pioneering work. Well, by orthostatic intolerance, we refer to a group of clinical conditions in which the symptoms worsen when we assume an upright posture and try to maintain it. Uh, and they improve when, but are not usually abolished by recumbency. The main physi physiologic challenge we face when we move from supine to standing is a 700, 500 to 750 milliliter uh, pooling of blood in the dependent circulation, a gravitational pooling of blood. And this uh, diagram is meant to show uh, uh, the um, There it is. Uh, the increased pooling in the dependent area, the diagram does not show quite as well how much pooling occurs in the abdominal circulation. Uh, if uh, we have a normal physiologic response to standing, initially there's a reduction in arterial pressure. Uh, then uh, because of a nerve response from the arterial baroreceptors, the cardiovascular nuclei send out a much uh, increased sympathetic nerve outflow. This leads to about a 10 to 20 beat increase in heart rate usually, uh, along with a mild increase in stroke volume. But the biggest impact comes from improved vasoconstriction, which helps mobilize that pooled blood back up to the heart and brain. If that does not occur normally, then you get symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. And those of you familiar with the MECFS symptoms will notice that lightheadedness, diminished concentration, headache, blurred vision, fatigue, and an exercise intolerance that looks very much like post-exertional malaise all are common in orthostatic intolerance syndromes. Those 
Symptoms on the left are thought due to reduced blood flow to the brain. The ones on the right are more related to a secondary increase in adrenergic activity, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and so on. And that can lead to a shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, tremulousness, anxiety, and other symptoms. The common forms of orthostatic intolerance that we see in pediatrics in general, but especially in pediatric ME-CFS, are abbreviated here as POTS, for postural tachycardia syndrome, and neurally mediated hypotension. This is uh, NMH for short. It's too much of a mouthful to say frequently. It is the same as what many of us learned in medical school as vasovagal syncope or neurocardiogenic syncope. We elected to remove the term syncope because many of our MECFS patients had not fainted. They were just hypotensive with standing. So we prefer that term. POTS is defined at the bottom as a 40-beat increase in heart rate between supine and standing or head-up tilt testing in adolescence. For adults, it's only a 30-beat increase. And in addition, uh, you can have uh, meet criteria for POTS if your heart rate goes above 120 beats per minute, but it must occur with orthostatic symptoms. You cannot simply have an asymptomatic individual who stands up, gets a high heart rate. You also need to be sure that you're not examining somebody who's in the middle of an acute dehydrating uh, illness. That's not POTS. It has to be prolonged. The patients with uh, NMH will not get that kind of same increase in heart rate. This was a medical student at Johns Hopkins who failed her first year because she could not sit for prolonged periods of time in the lecture hall. She was able to stand for about six minutes on the t tilt test and then suddenly her blood pressure dropped to the point where you could not remain conscious. Heart rate fell at the same time, very consistent with the neurally mediated response or vasovagal response. This slide is a schematic meant to summarize a great deal of the physiologic literature on these disorders. The main problems seem to be that with orthostatic intolerance, you get an increase in venous pooling and a defective ability to vasoconstrict and mobilize that blood back up. Many patients also have a reduction in their circulating blood volume. They are, we say colloquially, a court low. Uh, then in response to these two combinations, when you are upright, there is an exaggerated sympathoadrenal response. Not only the sympathetic nervous outflow from the brain, but also the adrenal gland pumping out excessive adrenaline. The pattern of, of uh, circulatory dysfunction is in some ways dependent on what the ratio of norepinephrine to epinephrine is. Norepinephrine is a very good vasoconstrictor. If you've got very high norepinephrine levels, you can maintain your blood pressure, heart rate will skyrocket, and you'll meet criteria for POTS. If you have more epinephrine, which is a skeletal vasculature, skeletal muscle bed dilator, you're more likely to get the hypotensive response. These are not entirely separate conditions. If you have POTS early in a tilt test, you can go on to faint later. We don't have to worry too much about uh, splitting hairs because the treatments are all the same. And I've shown you that here. Uh, we treat the excessive pooling with vasoconstrictor medications, the reduction in blood volume with sodium and, and volume expansion, and a variety of things to blunt the, the adrenergic response. So with that as a background, let's talk about the evidence for orthostatic intolerance in this illness. And I want to say that this is not a new observation. Here is a paper that I discovered after we got involved in this area published in 1940 in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled Orthostatic Hypotension and Orthostatic Tachycardia by McLean and Allen. And they wrote, uh, we have given the name orthostatic tachycardia to a syndrome which is characterized by an excessive acceleration of the heart when the patients change from the recumbent to the erect posture. Orthostatic exhaustion, blurring of vision, weakness on exercise, and syncopal episodes may occur. This is a syndrome, they wrote, which seems identical with effort syndrome, irritable heart, 
or neurocirculatory asthenia, all names that were used in the past for the phenomenology, for the phenomenon that we call MECFS now. They had the answer in 1940. They wrote four years later that it was due to a defective venous return to the heart. Again, quite prescient. We ignored this in medicine for the next 50 some years. And our group was working away. I run a or ran at the time a diagnostic clinic where I would see patients with a variety of disorders and some of them had CFS. We also noticed that uh, they were coming in back to back with patients with recurrent syncope. And around that time in the early 1990s, people had come up with the tilt table test as a way of evaluating people with recurrent syncope. So we, we were intrigued that the patients with MECFS had uh, fatigue provoked by standing in line, hot environments, especially a hot shower. They had to sit down for 20 minutes after a shower, uh, or even sitting for prolonged periods in class. Shopping in the shopping mall was particularly difficult for the young people with this. And I would argue that that is proof positive of an organic illness until uh, uh, we can see the uh, alternative. At any rate, in this study, we looked at seven, sync, uh, seven adolescents who had fatigue or CFS. None of them had fainted before. And we put them on a tilt table. And I'll just show you what that looked like. It's a motorized table with a footboard for weight bearing. We bring it up to 70 degrees for 45 minutes, looking at heart rate, blood pressure, and symptoms. If they tolerate that without dropping their blood pressure, we put the table down, started isoproteranol, which is like adrenaline, intended to increase their heart rate by about 20 beats, brought the table back up to 70 degrees for 15 minutes. If they tolerated that, we dropped the table again, started a higher dose of the isoproteranol, and the last phase was just a 10-minute component. So in that study, all seven of these patients had a profound drop in blood pressure. We reproduced their symptoms, and then we went on to treat them with the drugs that are used for recurrent syncope. Four of the seven got uh, a tremendous improvement, and we published that as a simple case series in The Lancet. Uh, the next week, I got 3,000 phone calls uh, and began realizing that there was a minor gap in the treatment of people with this disorder. The next question we asked was, could this be behind people with well-recognized CFS? So we began a pilot study that was intended to be, uh, to help us estimate the sample sizes for a randomized trial. And in that study, we recruited 23 uh, adults and adolescents with CFS. The mean age, uh, the range was 14 to 49. And they'd been sick for five years, so on average. 74% were unable to attend school or work. That probably sounds familiar to most of you. The features that were compatible with their orthostatic intolerance were lightheadedness in 96%, uh, sweating in 83%, abdominal discomfort and blurred vision in, in 78 and only 43% had had a prior episode of fainting. The other conditions that exacerbated their fatigue, that brought, a, brought it on, were physical exertion. Well, you could argue that's part of the definition of CFS. You're bound to see that. But what was less expected was the fact that a hot shower or prolonged standing would bring on their symptoms, a warm environment, and even an, a severe lightheaded episode could be followed by a day or two of fatigue. We put them through the same three-stage tilt test as we did in the earlier study. And I want to draw your attention to stage one. This is the first 45 minutes without any pharmacologic stimulation. 16 of our 23 patients developed hypotension versus none of the controls. Now, we know from other research that as you increase the amount of isoproteranol you give, all of us will faint. So you have to watch about how you interpret the third stage with the higher doses. But uh, in any event, overall, 22 of 23 CFS patients had hypotension, and th that was significantly different. And the odds ratio for developing hypotension during tilt was a whopping 55. And to put that in perspective, the odds ratio for developing cancer if you're a smoker is somewhere around 2.7. 
So this indicates a huge risk of uh, circulatory disorder if you've got this illness. More importantly than the absolute heart rate and blood pressure changes, however, is that we could make them worse with simple stage one upright posture. Everybody had worse fatigue. There was lightheadedness, warmth, nausea, sweating. This was a bad CF, CFS day, as the patients told us. Many of them had this physical finding. You often hear that the physical examination is normal in ME-CFS. It is if you never look, right? Uh, one of the things we see is this kind of acrocyanosis, a peripheral purple discoloration. Here's a girl who had been standing for about three or four minutes, and that's my hand behind hers to give you a, a sense of the disparity. Here, if you can see it, I've pressed my fingers into her legs, stepped back, picked up the camera, focused it, took a picture, it took five to 10 seconds. Still, she had no capillary refill. And if we saw this in an intensive care unit patient, we'd be very worried about their circulatory state. Uh, we offered open treatment to these 23 patients, 19 agreed, and we followed them after increasing their salt and fluid intake and trying them on the same medications that are used for recurrent fainting. Well, nine of 19 reported a substantial improvement in symptoms within a month and seven of the 19 reported being somewhat better. And I'll show you what that looked like graphically. We used a, an, a, what we call now a wellness score, where we ask, how have you been feeling in general in the past month, with zero meaning dying, and 100 being as good as you could imagine feeling? And this is a very simple question to ask at each visit. It correlates incredibly well with longer quality of life questionnaires. Our patients came in at about a 36, and within about two to three months, they were at close to 70. Not everybody had a complete improvement, but some of the improvements were quite dramatic. Since that time, uh, if we just focus on the pediatric data on orthostatic intolerance, every study that has had healthy controls has shown a much higher prevalence of orthostatic intolerance. I'm gonna have a slide on Julian Stewart's work in a minute. Uh, Dr. Tanaka in Japan did just seven minutes of active standing, and despite that short duration, 18 of his 28 patients had hypotension or POTS, but he was looking primarily at the amount of oxygen uh, uh, that was extracted from the cerebral circulation and how well patients recovered. It was abnormal in a lot more CFS patients than the controls. Uh, Vigard Willer, who's a bit west of here in Oslo, did a study I wish I had thought of. He noted that when you bring healthy people to 70 degrees, they often develop hypotension. So he thought, what about if we just bring them to 20, a rather innocuous stress? You do that if you're lying on the sofa watching television. Uh, and with that, uh, he was able to exaggerate the differences between healthy people and CFS patients. The CFS subjects had higher heart rates and diastolic pressures and abnormal sympathetic uh, autonomic tone. Uh, Barbara Galland in New Zealand did another study uh, confirming the same kinds of things. But let me show you what Julian Stewart in New York did. He compared uh, patients with POTS, uh, sorry, he looked at uh, controls, people with occasional fainting but no intermediate symptoms, and those with CFS. 18 of the 26 uh, CFS patients got POTS, but none in the other groups. 22 out of 26 developed hypotension. And if you combine them, all but I think one of his patients uh, had confirmed orthostatic intolerance on the tilt test. Another study that he did looked at the symptom profile. And he compared ME-CFS to people with POTS alone to those who are healthy. And you can see that for all of these symptoms, the ME patients were worse than the POTS patients who were worse than the healthy, except for sore throat, which did not discriminate between the groups. And we find that to be the least frequent of the ME symptoms in our patients. Uh, Dr. Wheeler in Oslo showed uh, measuring heart rate variability that at baseline, controls and CFS patients didn't differ very much. 
but when you expose them to tilt testing at an early phase, there's a dramatic and statistically significant difference in their sympathetic tone, as if they were jazzed up and using all of the fuel that they had to maintain their circulatory state. One other point to emphasize is that uh, cognitive symptoms can be related to this problem. Julian Stewart, again, did a very nice study uh, on uh, the inter interaction between orthostatic stress and cognitive function using a thing called an NBAC test. Patients watched a computer screen looking for the letter O. If they saw it, they pressed the button. That was the zero back test. If they saw an O one behind the last O, that was a one back. If it was two behind the last O, it was a two back, and so on. The, so the greater distance between the letter O, the greater the cognitive challenge. And here is what he found. This looks at the time that it took for people to respond. And here was the tilt angle at zero degrees. Patients with CFS and the controls didn't really differ very much. As the tilt angle got higher to 45 degrees, 60 and 75, you saw significantly more delayed cognitive responses in the affected patients. Similarly, if you looked at the complexity of the cognitive challenge, uh, they were the same if it was a zero back test, but once you ask them to do more um, thinking and uh, pay more attention, uh, you can see the increasing number of uh, response errors. So cognitive dysfunction can be a feature of orthostatic intolerance. And as I said, ME CFS is not just orthostatic intolerance, but there are some other features uh, that can affect both the response to upright posture and the symptoms. So let's talk about them. This is a schematic I give um, to my patients to emphasize that orthostatic intolerance plays a big role in the symptoms, but it is not one thing. So you have to look carefully for other comorbid conditions. Uh, depression can make you dizzy, it can make you tired, or MECFS can make you depressed. Uh, so you have to look at this as a bi-directional arrow. Anxiety is overrepresented in every form of orthostatic intolerance, but probably on a physiologic basis because catecholamines, if they're at a very high level, epinephrine, norepinephrine, will make you anxious, any of us. Uh, we'll talk about food allergies in a minute, but you need to look at all of these other factors to find other treatable components of the condition. We'll talk about uh, the Ehlers-Danlos joint hypermobility connection. Uh, we had had one patient in my pediatric clinic with acknowledged Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We uh, wondered uh, about whether we might see others. When a second showed up, we began looking at this more systematically with a Bighton score, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. And as we looked at the next 100 adolescents, we found uh, 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 Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in 12 of those uh, uh, with CFS. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a syndrome with connective tissue laxity, so skin is stretchy, ligaments are stretchy, and they have vascular problems such as early varicose veins. Most have fatigue, and most are described as having pain of obscure origin. Uh, in our group, we had six with classical type EDS and six with hypermobile type. Since then, it's more the hypermobile pattern. All of them had orthostatic intolerance. So we were able to clump together these three seemingly disparate syndromes that had never been connected before. Uh, the fatigue in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome has a major impact on quality of life. It was thought to just be an untreatable component of that syndrome. Here's the Bighton score. You get one point on each side for being able to bring your fifth finger back past 90 degrees, one point for the thumb to the forearm, a point on each side for more than 10 degrees of hyperextension at the elbows and the knees, and the ninth point is for the palms to the floor without bending your knees. These patients can also do other tricks if you ask them, like uh, put their knuckles together, a lot of hyperextension here, they get early onset stretch marks. Their wounds do not heal well. This was a girl who had, whose hand you saw earlier who had um, had an appendectomy and the laparoscopy scar uh, dehissed, came apart. So the first time the surgeon sewed it up and thought, all right, 
Uh, the second time, they thought the mother and the child were tearing out the stitches by uh, Munchausen syndrome. Uh, but really, what she had was Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where we know that the, the wounds don't heal well. They can also avert their eyelids and touch their tongue to their nose at times. So we wondered, OK, we've seen Ehlers-Danlos syndrome 12 in 100. You're supposed to see it 1 in 5,000 in the population. That was clearly a difference. Then we wondered about milder forms of joint hypermobility. And this slide it shows the Bighton scores that we grouped into categories of 0 to 1 and so on. 9 is the top score. Our healthy people in yellow uh, had a Bighton score uh, median of 1. And 20% uh, had a score of 4 or higher, con uh, consistent with joint hypermobility. That's what you'll find in any high school group. These are the dancers, the swimmers, the gymnasts. It is not a disease, it's a trait. Uh, in contrast, look at the difference in the distribution curve for the MECFS patients. Their median score was four. 60% of them met criteria for joint hypermobility. Now, how are those two things connected? We think that uh, the amount of blood you pool in your limbs depends a bit on how stretchy the vessel wall is. And if you've got stretchy connective tissue, you will be predisposed to more vascular pooling in the dependent circulation. There are other theories about that, but uh, uh, we may talk about that later. I want to move on to the issue of food allergies. Uh, we were interested in this overlap of, of what we call non-IgE mediated, mediated milk allergy. They have negative skin tests and negative blood tests for milk. And we suspect milk protein hypersensitivity if they have two of these three symptoms, reflux, early satiety, and epigastric or abdominal pain. They, in our study, they had to have improvement in their GI symptoms with a milk-free diet. And they had to then have two recurrences, at least two recurrences, following either purposeful or inadvertent re-exposure to cow's milk protein. They also had to have no evidence of an immediate or anaphylactic reaction to milk protein, no hives and urticaria. So of the people in our cohort study, we were referred 72, 17 were excluded, so we enrolled 55 and followed them for two years. In all, 31% were milk sensitive. Uh, their symptoms are shown here compared to the other non-milk sensitive group. There was more vomiting in infancy. Uh, as expected, because we used these three as the screening criteria, they had way more early satiety, epigastric pain, and reflux. They also had more aphthous ulceration, small ulcers inside the uh, mouth. Uh, only 43% knew that milk was a problem for them. And the fact that they were continuing to ingest milk uh, also affected their quality of life. On a standard quality of life measure, the milk sensitive patients were sicker and more impaired than the ones who were not milk sensitive. However, with equal treatment otherwise of their medical problems and the addition of a milk-free diet to this group, by six months, the quality of life scores did not differ. So that's a very treatable thing to look for in pediatric MECFS. What about movement restrictions? This has taken up uh, our interest in the last little while. We noted uh, an increased prevalence of postural abnormalities in our patients. And this boy shows you a very head forward posture, which is not mechanically sensible. Uh, it, it, it requires way more work. His back is rounded. And we noticed that when the patients would go to see a very good physical therapist, they would call me the next day and say, am I supposed to feel this tired the, the day after the assessment? We knew at this point that they would start feeling better with the treatment sessions. But after the assessment, they were worse. So we wondered. Was this changing somehow their blood pressure and heart rate? So we did a uh, test with two boys who were in college. And I just want to describe it for you. We, we lifted their leg to 10 degrees, measured heart rate, blood pressure, pulse oximetry, and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Then we went to 20 degrees for two minutes, then to 30 for two, 40, 50, and 60. So the whole test took 12 minutes. It should be innocuous to most of us. Somebody's doing the work lifting your leg. We asked them to tell us their symptoms on a 0 to 10 scale. And here's what we saw. In red is fatigue. They came in with fatigue, 5.5 out of 10. Up to the 60-minute point, they got worse. 
their cognitive fogginess in green got worse such that when we asked them to give us a number, these college students said, uh, huh? They were really impaired by this simple strain on the nervous system. Uh, they had uh, increasing lightheadedness, even though as you raise the leg, you should have been improving blood return to the heart. And they had other orthostatic symptoms lying flat. So there was, uh, this was very interesting to us because you can, tr you, uh, uh, we, we started looking for more evidence of movement restrictions. And in the recent cohort study we did, we found 48 uh, uh, patients where we could match them to a control by gender and by their bite and score category. We wanted to compare hypermobile CFSME patients with uh, hypermobile controls. And this is a busy slide, uh, but it shows that on all of the 11 physical therapy measures that we uh, conducted, the CFS patients had numerically higher rates of tightness and reduced range of motion than did the healthy people. And on six of the measures, there was a statistically significant difference. Showing you that graphically, this is the score, range of motion score, which could go from zero, meaning no impairment, up to a maximum of 11, where everything was tight. And you can again see a very different distribution in the controls in gray and the CFS patients in the uh, purple. So that uh, this is something that accompanies joint hypermobility. Pa patients can be so loose along the spine that other areas are tight but it's another treatable component. Uh, we find it critical to treat these areas before advancing pa patients to uh, exercise. Somebody might say, well, isn't this just because these patients have been inactive and in bed? But we looked at their activity level if they had a high score or a low score on range of motion. And on a, on a number of measures, they really uh, had about the same activity level. So this will be an area that we will be focusing on uh, more in the future. Lastly, as, a, as a, a small point, a subset of patients with ME-CFS um, have Chiari malformation or cervical stenosis. These are neuroanatomic syndromes that cause compression of the uh, brain stem and uh, uh, can present with both fatigue and orthostatic intolerance. So there's likely to be an overlap. Many patients who have these disorders were thought to have fibromyalgia or ME-CFS before. Here, for example, is a young girl that I followed for a number of years with POTS that we could not control. Her heart rate would go from 100 to 150 in five minutes of standing. She had no response to our usual medications and had a lot of anxiety that even she recognized was misplaced. It was irrational, but she couldn't stop it. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, and if there's a chance to lower the lights, perhaps you'll see it better. Are you, can you see it from the back? Uh, in any event, she had uh, finally on a repeated examination an abnormal Hoffman sign where you flick the fingers and you look for an involuntary pinching. Uh, that led me to get a cervical spine MRI uh, she had a congenitally narrowed cervical spine. There's no spinal fluid, as is here in white, uh, cushioning the spinal cord. Uh, her canal diameter was about 8 millimeters most of the way. It should be 12 to 14 millimeters. And at this point, she had a disc that was bulging and compressing on the cervical spine. The surgeon who looked at her said, I don't know about this fatigue stuff, but that disc bulge has to be fixed. So he replaced the disc within uh, six, within two months, this girl was out walking dogs as a, as a job. Six months later, she was saddling horses and taking people out on horse rides at a Colorado camp. And uh, nine months later, she was in full-time university. She had not been able to finish high school or to finish a single course in college because of the intensity of her symptoms. That's three years ago. She has absolutely flourished. She has been able to be a full-time student, to take a part-time job, and to do wedding photography on the weekends. We're a little worried that she's uh, uh, overdoing it. But she's had no further symptoms. And very interestingly to me, she's had a big reduction in her anxiety. So in conclusion, uh, all of the studies that have adolescent controls in which the response to upright posture is measured uh, in, in those with ME-CFS show higher rates of orthostatic intolerance. 
upright uh, posture consistently aggravates ME-CFS symptoms in both children and adults. Uh, all of the studies that look at heart rate variability and autonomic tone show a sympathetic predominance. Uh, there are physical findings as well of dependent acrocyanosis and joint hypermobility. And we believe that the recognition and treatment of orthostatic intolerance provides an avenue for pragmatic and individualized treatment of symptoms in those with ME-CFS. And this is an, a critically important part of the way we manage patients. Here's an example from our recent cohort study showing the wellness scores uh, in 55 consecutive patients in the low 50s when they first came in. And with multidisciplinary treatment of the things I showed you today, by uh, 12 months they were up to about 75, which is usually consistent with going to school and getting by even when you have symptoms. We still uh, need to focus on the group who are more severely impaired and didn't improve, but I wanted to leave you with this uh, as a message of hope for uh, the, the response to therapy. And I'd like to, again, thank uh, Lisa and the organizers for the invitation to come and, and uh, speak with you today. Thank you, Peter, for this overview of uh, the topic. I'm certain that we have, do we have time for one question or two? Henrik, what do you say? One? Okay. Do I have a, a, a mic, microphone for the audience? Okay. Gentleman there. Just, just a second. Uh, Peter, on, on the patient you mentioned uh, with the uh, POTS and the uh, cervical stenosis, did she have neck pain or symptoms that uh, would have? <coughs> no, it was, it was rather surprising. She didn't have a lot of neck pain, uh, and her neurologic examination was entirely normal all along. The real clue was that her mother had had four operations on her neck. I didn't pay enough attention to the fact that she'd had uh, herself cervical nar narrowing and two operations for thoracic outlet syndrome. And my rule has usually been I need to see an abnormality on the neurologic examination before I get an MRI of the cervical spine or brain. But we may want to think differently in those with a positive family history of one of these disorders, and especially if they are really refractory to the standard therapies. How, how many patients have you seen with a positive Hoffman's? Uh, I don't have that number in hand, David, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's not everybody with these abnormalities. Uh, thank One you very much question. for your speech. Yes. Thank you very much for your speech. I'm a medical doctor at the rehabilitation clinic here in Stockholm, Dandrid, and uh, we meet a lot of uh, EDS patients. And uh, my question to you is if you have seen the correlation between neurocognitive disorders, ADD, and EDS, because that's something we really see a lot of. I think that's a great question. I don't know that anyone has studied it formally, but certainly the cognitive features of ME-CFS that are there in the EDS population look as if somebody suddenly acquired ADD. So it's problems with concentration, short-term memory, focus. And I, f I think uh, if you think about it as an acquired form of ADD, we know that doesn't really occur. But this may be related to the circulatory uh, dysfunction and not getting enough blood flow to the brain. Very interesting point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. I didn't say it in the beginning, but uh, you work at the John Hopkins Children's Center in the USA.